Welcome everyone. It's uh, the beginning of a what seems to be going, what seems it's going to be a long cold Cape Town winter. If this is anything to go by, and the storm warnings that have been issued. Um, so thank you very much on the campaign for safe communities on behalf of the campaign for coming out tonight for this discussion. We really appreciate it. My, my name is Sean Tate. I'm working with an organization called APCOF, which is the African Policing Civilian Oversight Forum. And we're working with the African Commission on Human and People's Rights to begin the process of developing a set of guidelines on the use of conditions of police custody and pretrial detention in Africa. Now, there, there are several instruments that speak to the rule of law and the guidelines of fair trial are one of them. But in the in the engagement with, um, with the African com uh, Commission and um, our interaction, both in terms of the policing oversight mandate, but also looking at conditions of detention and work around torture prevention, the issue of that pre-trial detention phase has come up again and again. Um, it certainly is one of the most overlooked areas within that criminal within the criminal justice environment in Africa, and therefore um, the, the discussions and the consideration that perhaps a more focused input on guidelines for police use of arrest, uh, police custody and pretrial detentions is appropriate. And certainly the African Commission has responded positively to that, and they mandated uh, the Special Rapporteur on conditions of detention to, have, to focus specifically on developing a set of guidelines on pre-trial detention and to discuss an implementation framework. Um, certainly this is not anything new to, to the South African condition, and I'm sure the other speakers will speak to this in more detail. But when we look at the uh, reports from the Judicial Inspectorate uh, of Prisons, uh, the Office of the Inspecting Judge, then we see that you know, some 30% of, of the inmates within South African custodial facilities are still awaiting trial. And this is far in excess of the numbers that um, the correctional services themselves have set as targets around the, the proportion of sentenced inmates versus um, uh, those on remand. And we also notice that the, the time spent by prisoners um, in remand custody is also quite long. Um, one in 20 have been there for over two years, and some 33% held for longer than six months. So this is not a short in and out, and within that environment, uh, persons <coughs> in that pre-trial justice phase are extremely vulnerable to a range of infringements on their rights, um, particularly around corruption, the, 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 um, the vulnerability that uh, police and justice <coughs> officials within that pre-trial phase um, have some influence over the process and then you can solicit bribes to try and influence what happens. Uh, but also the ability to exercise the rights that are afforded to sentence prisoners um, and uh, the uh, conditions of, of um, custody as, as opposed to those with, within the sentenced environment. Um, later during the evening, we will focus more specifically on the guidelines and we hope to really elicit your views um, on the utility of the guidelines, the substance of the guidelines, which I'm sure you, you all have, um, and then particularly, you know, having, having a set of guidelines like this, what can we do, particularly here in South Africa, to really assist in the implementation if and when passed. Um, I'm not going to speak for much longer, but I'm going to hand over to... Zaki, uh, <laughs> to the Office of the Inspecting Judge. Um, uh, I'm afraid Umish was not able to make it tonight, so um, his colleague will, will take us forward in that discussion. Um, and then we'll follow that agenda and, and then focus more specifically on the text of the guidelines. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Okay. Okay. I was hoping Saki would start. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no one has signed. I think I'm ready to go. Good evening. Um, my name is James Matilda. 
and with the legal services of the judicial inspectorate and if, if with the complaints unit. Um, that's the unit at which most of the complaints were arrived from inmates, from members of the public, family members, sometimes from other um, state organs, you know, from the Human Rights Commission, Parliament, and from many other sources. Now, um, I wasn't uh, actually ready to, to be here, as you had uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Omish Raga, is supposed to be here. And he sends his apology. And uh, I want to hope that uh, I will do justice to the issues I need to speak to. Um, I'm, I'm going to mainly speak on the complaints and what we normally refer to as mandatory reports. Now, um, within the legal services of the Judicial Inspectorate, we have three units. The first one being complaint. The second being mandatories. The third one being investigations and, and inspections. Now, I'm going, only going to speak about the two, and I'll explain what they entail. With mandatories, in terms of the provisions of the Act, that is the Correction and Services Act, Article 1 of 1998, Section 30, Section 31, and 32, and also Section 15. First, Section 15 speaks of the deaths that are happening within the correction and services, either natural and or unnatural. They are, it, it, is, it is mandatory for the department to report to the inspectorate any death. And of course, the inspectorate can institute its own investigations. And uh, in terms of Section 30, that is the use of force. Force which may be used on inmates. Force normally gets used in a number of uh, instances, like for example, when inmates are unruly and or misbehaving and or fighting amongst themselves. But often we find that the force, the amount of force used is not proportionate to um, the particular harm that uh, the officials had intended to avert. Um, then there is a, a use of mechanical restraints. Mechanical restraints, you are handcuffs, uh, leg shackles, <coughs> and all that. Um, they are also mandatory reportable to the inspectorate each time they have been used. And uh, for some time, of course, uh, the use of force in particular, we, we, there has not been a, an icon on our website for purposes that uh, head of centers would be able to report such. And in most instances, they were just not reporting at all, although indeed force is being used against England. But now, um, more and more we find it that they are reporting. And um, uh, although indeed uh, we are looking at, at them as use of force, but more often we find that they are actually not use of force, but actually assault perpetrated by officials or inmates. Recently we also have added uh, a classification called um, sexual assault. It's very shocking that we begin to see inmates allegedly being sexually assaulted and or raped by correctional officials. Very shocking, indeed. Now, um, I'm firstly going to speak to the deaths of remand detainees within our correctional centers. I'll firstly speak to the unnatural deaths. Unnatural deaths are those that happen unnatural, so to speak, maybe an inmate is said to have committed suicide by hanging, an inmate is killed by another in, other inmate and or during the process of assault, they end up dying, something like that. Now, I'm, I'm going to speak to the period between October 2012 and December 2012. Within that period, we had about, that is a period of two months, we had about five unnatural deaths. Now, something that I need to speak to 
from the outset. It's very shocking to note that uh, most of these deaths that happen, they are actually happening within very short periods of time upon admission to the centers. As short a period as two days. An inmate is admitted on the 17th of 10, 2012. On the 19th of 10, 2012, he's dead. Cause of death is unnatural suicide by hanging. A remind detainee is alleged to have committed suicide by hanging himself in the shower behind the curtain. The robe used by the deceased was made of bed sheet. In others, two months, 26 days, 23 days, seven days, four days. It's very shocking. Just four days you're admitted into the center, then the next thing you're dead. And there doesn't appear to be any assessment of any kind that is being done on this inmate. It is obligatory on, on, on the department in terms of Section 8 of the Correctional Services Act to assess these inmates upon admission. In most instances, if I am to read whether the deceased was medically assessed upon admission, just the five that we took into, we found the following. No, no documents indicating inmate was medically assessed upon admission. In almost all of them, no documents indicating inmate was medically assessed upon admission. The cause of death of inmate is, uns uh, is, is unsure, but awaiting the histology results. Inmate's medical history continuation sheet does not indicate whether he had been medically assessed. Almost all of them. And I guess the problem may be, may be that uh, the department we found uh, of late, actually as, as of last year, October, we did uh, a pilot project here in Palsmo. We, we sought to understand much of what is happening just on admission only. We found very, very, very shocking um, findings there. Um, most of the officials that are working at admission, most of them do not even have any idea on the processes they need to follow on admitting them. They don't at all. They don't know what is expected of them. And in majority of cases, when this inmate get admitted and they get to see a medical practitioner, the, whatever assessment and or treatment and or um, consultation that needs to happen, there is no privacy at all. With the result that most inmates may of course be sick but be ashamed and or unable to tell because everything is just happening in the presence of everyone. And we find in that most inmates, either of course they may have told the official rather the nurse in question and or they have not told them, but the reality is that uh, the shortage within the department of professional staff is shocking. I'm talking your nurse, your social workers, your psychiatrists, your psychologists and all that. In majority of instances, like in your Paltzmo here, you will find um, in your Paltzmo maximum, which is a, a center with an inmate capacity of about 3,000 plus, they are being attended to by um, two social workers, uh, one psychologist. And you know, these psychologists also themselves are very much uh, um, you know, it's, it's just too much for them to be able to do justice to all these issues. Now, um, let me speak then to the natural deaths. These natural deaths are those deaths that are said to have been caused naturally. Supposing an inmate got admitted, he then told them I'm suffering from TB or whatever you may. Often you would find they don't have access to medical help. Sometimes you would tell the officials, look, I am sick, but they just don't believe you. Because of course, some inmates have a tendency of always complaining or complaining, complaining about the same thing, with the result that some officials don't end up even caring at all. You are lying or whatever. You are a persistent complainer, and that's it. And you find that um, they end up uh, dying of very seriously treatable diseases. 
I mean TB. TB is treatable, we all know that, providing of course you follow the prescription and you uh, change your prescription until you find and all that. Now, uh, between the period of October 2012 to December 2012, 34 deaths of human detainees died as a result, I would say in code, natural, because we, uh, when I say in code, it's because although it is said to be natural, we are entirely not convinced that they are natural. Although indeed we are not medical experts to tell whether or not it is so, but we are saying in quotes because in terms of how uh, death is reported, like for example, if an inmate has died, there needs to be a doctor who will be called upon to declare him dead, whatever of them, or the process that need to be followed. And the doctor in question, there is a form that you need to complete. Also, to be authenticated by the head of center, including the area commission. In majority of the, all those deaths that have been reported, you would find a doctor is said to have certified the death, but the doctor in question never signed the form in question to confirm indeed that it is so. Because the doctor is expected to tell what the inmate may have been suffering from looking at the medical history from the medical file of the inmate and tell, okay, inmate, he said to have been suffering from X, Y, and Z, and now he is dead, therefore the cause of death will be Y. But in majority of cases we find things like that are not happening. Okay, um, 34 deaths just within two months. And of course, if you, if you have a look at our last year's annual report, I think we detailed much of all these happenings, and uh, in detail, Society need to actually come out and, and, and talk to these issues. It's unfortunate, of course, in South Africa we are a very vengeful society. Very vengeful. We, we actually don't care about those who have been condemned to the correctional facilities. We hardly do, even don't visit them. You know, we, we are glad. As a matter of fact, maybe that may be one of the reasons why correctional officials are actually treating them with impunity. Because, you know, almost we seem to be like a society that says, lock them up and throw away the key. We don't care what happens to them. But we find it is shocking because, listen, you're putting people in correctional centers for purposes that they be rehabilitated from their evil deeds, but then you are ending up turning them into more animal because you just don't care. Like, for example, somebody is in custody for having committed rape. And yet, rape has been perpetrated against you by correctional officials and nothing happens to him whoever is doing that. Somebody is in jail for assault, and he is being assaulted, and nothing is tied to the person who assaulted. And I mean, come on, there is no justice there. Which is why most of these inmates, and of course this is also part of the reason why there is too much interest in gangsterism, because I mean, oh, five minutes, oh, thank you. Okay, I never looked at the time, thank you so very much. I'll try to speed up, I'll try to speed up. Um, Okay, let me then get to the, the, the complaints, the complaints themselves. But I think you get a picture of what is happening within the deaths, natural and unnatural. Now, with the, with the complaints, this is the scenario. For the period between April 2012 to March 2013, the complaints unit of the inspectorate received 59 complaints. These are the complaints. Of course, the, the, the number 59 is not actually the, 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 the only number of complaints being dealt with because there are certain complaints that have been dealt with at center level by our ICCPs, the, 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 the Independent Correctional Center visitors. There are also complaints that have been dealt with by the regions and all that. I'm mainly here speaking to those complaints that were referred to the complaints unit of the directory. Western Cape and Eastern Cape, the regions are the ones with the highest number of complaints. The most prevalent complaints received from inmates relates to assault, official on inmates, and health care. And um, the assault, official on inmate category, in most, in, in, in most cases, inmates indicate that they were unaware of the reasons for the, for the assault on them. The most common injury sustained would be bruises on their bodies, and often, they are not actually, the law mandates that upon either assault and or use of force, force being used on them, 
they be medically attended to immediately. In most instances, they're just assaulted, and then when they need to be seen by the doctor, they are only going to be seen by the doctor after the wounds have healed, with the result that if they were to prefer charges with the police, J88 is not properly completed, there is no evidence, and therefore the public prosecutor will then water down the case saying no, 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 no evidence, and that's it. So basically that is the picture. I think uh, I will just leave it at that. Um, I will just leave it at that. But that is exactly what we now are in, and more and more, especially for this year, we're finding that uh, indeed this uh, Statistics are growing more and more, and uh, it's really shocking. Thank you so very much. Thank you, James. Um, when we open up for discussion on the guidelines, we'll also allow opportunity for you to ask any questions of, of any of the speakers. But I'm going to hand over to Claire Ballard now from the Community Law Centre at the University of the Western Cape to make the next input. Good evening everyone, my name is, is Claire Ballard. I work at the University of the Western Cape um, at a research institute called the Community Law Centre. Um, I research in a particular project um, called the Civil Society Prison Reform Initiative, which is um, dedicated to furthering human rights initiatives in predominantly um, places in which people are deprived of their liberty. Um, so the connection with pre-trial detention and its connected services is, is obvious. Um, just by way of introducing the topic, I'm going to take us through various findings and statistics and sort of problem areas in, in this field. Um, I think it's important to, when, to, to draw to your attention the fact that when, um, sorry, when discussing the plight of um, any group or body of people that are deprived of their liberty, um, I think it's important to take into account what sort of oversight mechanism um, is available to make that facility more transparent, open, accountable, etc. And, and in that regard, I think it's important to distinguish between um, awaiting trial detainees who are detained in prisons and those who are detained in police cells. Uh, the, the, the situation for either group is quite different. Um, the, for example, the, the, uh, the standard in relation to when use of force can be used during arrest in, in, in the two different scenarios are, are very different. One. For example, the standard in, in relation to police cells is much lower than it is um, um, in, that in correctional services. Um, the conditions are different. Um, the, the amenities to which either group of detainee are entitled are different. Um, and importantly, the oversight bodies which, which um, monitor the conditions of detention are very different than, as are their mandates. So we know with correctional centres that the Office of the Inspecting Judge um, is the monitoring body that is responsible for two things, um, recording and dealing with complaints and, and, and conducting inspections. Um, the one, you know, the, the body responsible for monitoring conditions of detention in police cells is called the Independent Policing Investigative Directorate, IPID. Um, its mandate is different. Um, for the very, uh, um, it's, it's sort of half a judicial inspectorate and then a little bit more of an investigative body. It has policing powers, um, it has powers of search and seizure, Pina and so on, but it doesn't have, it's a reactive function, it doesn't actually inspect or monitor. And that I think is a very important failing, um, not necessarily of the IPID, but of the legislation governing, governing this problem. Um, I think any facility which is holding people, um, which um, sort of by definition is notoriously covert, um, we, we're setting ourselves up for some problems, and of course we know that we are since um, and, you know, the, the coverage of these kinds of problems in relation to the, the, the police brutality have been sort of widely um, discussed over the last few weeks. So, but I think the first and most important place to start is, is with policing because that's where the sort of pre-trial issue begins. Um, this is, these statistics are based on last year's policing um, annual report. Um, more than half of the arrests made every year are for non-priority crimes, and those those are crimes sort of on a level with or less than shoplifting. So we're arresting people for stupid stuff. Um, the detection rate for serious crimes, murder, uh, attempted murder, 
very serious assault, gang rape, rape, and so on, statutory rape. Um, the stuff for you think we want to prosecute, the detection rate for those are incredibly low. And what we mean by detection rate is um, are the, the matters that eventually proceed to court. Those that, if, those that do proceed to court, um, less than half of those will result in a conviction. Not even a guilty conviction, just somewhat a conviction. Um, yeah. So, and, and in fact, for all the, the offences listed, very few of them actually proceed to court, and far fewer of those result in a guilty conviction. Um, this has obvious implications um, in the criminal justice system, and it's, it's, it's functioning or lack thereof, but it, it paints a picture of why perhaps our pretrial detention and it's the connected services are so poor and overburdened. Um, yeah. The Western Cape and Kauteng have it have the worst. Um, and you can see Polsmoor and Crowclay are um, have some of the highest occupations in the country, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later and link up that theme. Um, but we care about pre-trial detention um, in correctional facilities and, and police centres because it's a very important driving factor behind prison overcrowding and, or any sort of overcrowding in, in a detention facility in general. So in, uh, nationally, our prison capacity is about 133%, but that's a very misleading average. It sounds quite good, in fact, given what it is in the rest of Africa. Um, but the 20 of the most overcrowded facilities in the country are between 200 and 260% full. Um, these are calculated on the Department of Correctional Services' own space norm of 3.44 square meters, which is below the international norm to start with. Um, this means that each inmate, and this includes, pre, um, this includes remand detainees, has between 1.3 and 1.7 meters of space, floor space, which is less than a single bed to themselves. Um, the remand detainee population in the country accounts for about one third of the prison population. This is an enormously high rate. Um, it's comparatively low in respect of most of the African region, at least sub-Saharan region. Um, but given the um, sophistication, if I can call it, of our criminal justice services in relation to countries like Nigeria and so on, which has a 60 to 70 percent um, remand detainee population, um, it's, it's fairly dismal. Um, the, the proposed benchmark is see from, from DCS is 25,000. That's based on its own space norm, and as you can see, we're exceeding that by, by a long way. Okay. Now, in addition to um, prison overcrowding, the, the other issue, which is a clear, quite a clear, for the constitutional lawyers um, here, is quite a clear liberty issue. Um, prison overcrowding, um, yeah, in relation to, to pre-trial detainees uh, is governed largely by your fair, what we call fair trial rights in the Constitution. They're very specific norms for what any inmate in a facility is entitled to. Um, when you're talking about spending a very long time in custody, it becomes a liberty issue, because you can't be detained um, without what, we, what the Constitution calls um, just cause. Um, and this is the terrain that, that lengthy um, period of um, custodial detention um, sort of um, highlights. Uh, Sean, in his introduction, mentioned that you know, one in 20 people have been in, uh, awaiting trial in custody for more than two, more than two years. That's about 2,000 people uh, in the country. Um, and some of those have been awaiting eight or nine years. Um, and so it's, um, it, it takes less than a couple of weeks to lose your job as a result of being incarcerated. So the type of effects of this kind of um, awaiting trial period, um, whilst we are incarcerated, are obviously very serious. You know, loss of time to the community, loss of the job, income. Often, it's a um, it's a male breadwinner that is that is being incarcerated, um, the loss of the parent, and so on. So the socioeconomic um, effects of the of this of this issue are are enormous. There was a very a well publicized case that um, was heard for um, a large part of 2011 and 2012, which was the case of Daddy Lee. Um, it sort of brought to light the conditions of detention um, in, in the sort of pre trial facility at, at Polsmoor Prison, um, which is certainly up on the top 20 list. Um, 
And this was, this, this excerpt here was taken by the expert witness who was a doctor who examined Daddy, um, who was kept um, awaiting trial for four and a half years on a non-violence charge. Um, so, uh, but, you know, he was <coughs> charged a fraud, ultimately acquitted. Um, but um, it, it raises the question why somebody would be detained for that long on a, on a, on a, um, on a serious but non-violent charge. That's certainly not the spread in which the bail legislation and the Criminal Procedure Act was adopted. Um, and this really just, just brings to mind the more human aspect of, of what detainees are sort of forced to suffer. Um, and for the most part, um, we're dealing with um, a, a, an indigent prison popular, uh, remand detainee population who um, are sort of compelled to use the services of, of the legal aid board who for the most part are, are overburdened. Um, they, they certainly tend to do as best of a job that, that they can and largely they do but they, they really are overburdened. Um, and without um, access to, to legal counsel um, or access as often as you would like it, um, one cannot make a repeated bail application um, you know, if one feels they have reason, simply because it's difficult to access a lawyer. One can't appeal um, the, um, the finding of a, of a judge in a bail application, for example. There are lots of sort of, um, I guess, knock-on effects of, of, of being an indigent person without sufficient access to legal representation. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the kinds of legislation that govern this. Um, in March last year, the Correctional Matters Amendment Act was passed, and, and this, for the first time, the Department of Correctional Services acknowledged that the management, what they call the management of remand detainees or, or the waiting trial population, was firmly in in their sort of um, in their hands. And, and this, this sounds rather innocuous because, of course, it's, it's in their hands, but it's a never the, the sort of responsibility for the awaiting trial population had never formally been acknowledged by the Department of, of, of Correctional Services. Um, the argument had always been, well, we deal with the sentence population. We don't deal with those await, uh, awaiting trials, even though they're in our facilities. Um, bizarre argument to make, and, and one that was certainly incorrect. Um, so this was a sort of um, a landmark occasion for many activists who've been wanting this kind of formal acknowledgement for a long time. Uh, what the, um, what the, piece of legislation does is it incorporates a number of really important amendments about the care of awaiting child detainees into the primary piece of legislation which is called the Correctional Services Act which monitors or which regulates um, almost everything about prisons and implementation of punishment in this country. Um, so it, it has, we now have a chapter called Remand Detention or what we call awaiting trial. Um, it speaks or very briefly about pregnant awaiting trial detainees, disabled awaiting trial detainees, the aged, um, and I think mentally ill, although I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, they're rather sort of glib provisions, but nevertheless they, they are there, and that is certainly something um, for which the department could be um, sort of lauded. Where the problem lies, though, is, is, is sort of what, what James was, was alluding to, is that these, the services don't exist. Um, Certainly, if you're a sentenced inmate, the, the, the legislation is um, very clear about what you're entitled to, as is the Constitution. Rehabilitation services, education, uh, educational programs, um, education and training, um, blah, blah, blah. It, for, for awaiting trial um, detainees, that certainly isn't the case. Um, they're not entitled to these things because they're not sentenced to a facility. Um, they're not being rehabilitated. They're simply awaiting trial. And that is really what they do, they wait. Um, and certainly with, with children awaiting trial in, in prison, that's an enormous problem because they're not attending school. Even if they might be of a compulsory school-going age, which is 15 or, or grade 9, um, you've got this large group of children who are um, having a very important right violated. Um, another, I, I've written their maximum custody period, but it, it, it makes me a bit angry because there is this provision in the, which was incorporated by this amendment act. Um, which is entitled maximum custody period, except it's not that. It says after two years you can have your um, um, sort of remand detention or awaiting trial 
um, sort of reviewed by court. Um, and it was very misleading for the department to phrase it like that, because unlike other countries where they do have a maximum cap on the time that you can um, um, remain in custody pending trial, this isn't that. Uh, it isn't that at all. If anything, it's, it's a review mechanism which empowers the court to remind you in, in prison for another year at a time. So it's useless, unfortunately. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is, is the U United Nations Convention Against Torture. Um, we are a signatory to that. Um, we have been for well over 10 years. Last year, um, we, um, uh, the, the government finally introduced and approved, well, almost approved, near there, um, a bill called the Prevention and Combating of Torture of Persons Act. Um, this incorporates the principles of international law which are spelled out, spelled out in the convention. Um, this provides an enormous source of protection for pretrial detainees um, because they are precisely the kind of population you want to protect from things like torture. The, you know, and the incidents we hear of every day, be they out of custody or in <coughs> custody, but obviously those in custody are a hell of a lot more vulnerable than those who aren't. Um, the other thing that we have signed but not ratified is what we call the optional protocol to that convention. Um, if anything, it's more important because it um, makes us subject to a, f um, a form of monitoring um, from an international committee, and um, which would solve the problem of not having a monitoring um, sort of establishment in your peace cells. They've been promising to ratify this for years and years, and they were due to last September, they didn't. Uh, we're hoping they will. They haven't yet, have they? We, we, we were hoping that they will this year. Um, but that would open us up to a whole new form of, of monitoring and sort of transparency into um, police detention, which unfortunately is a largely ignored um, uh, sort of black hole in our, in our sort of criminal justice system. Um, as you can see, the, the Judicial Inspector does an enormously important monitoring function which makes this kind of information that we have and we are probably stats from um, available to the public. But with, with police cell detention, with police detention in general, there is almost nothing. Um, and very little with which civil society can use as a platform to insist that these um, places of detention be opened up. Um, I'm going to end on that note, um, but hopefully we can have some questions later. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, our last speaker for the evening is Zaki Ahmed from the Social Justice Coalition to speak about some experiences around the control of the justice environment. Um, good evening. I think most of the data and stuff has um, been covered. I want to perhaps start uh, from a different angle. About a hundred years ago, in 1911 or so, there was a strike in Johannesburg. And it was a strike of tram workers. And those tram workers were beaten really badly by the police, and it caused a huge struggle on, in, in Johannesburg. And what happened as a consequence is the police tried to frame the strikers and they got an informer to plant dynamite on the strikers. A case called Whitaker versus uh, Whitaker and Moran versus Russ. Russ. And what happened to these these two guys is they got given bail. They were arrested, they got given bail. Their bail was a thousand pounds, which at today's level would be probably about ten thousand rand, maybe hundred thousand rand. They couldn't afford it because they were workers who were stuck. Turns out that the informant set them up. But when they go to the prison, what happens is this Fort Prison in Johannesburg. Those prisoners get put there, they get segregated, so they don't simply get uh, put with the other awaiting trial prisoners. They get segregated from all other prisoners. They don't get put into the 
ordinary cells, they get put into punishment cells. And the punish punishment cells are cells without any lights. It's holes. It's closed. They're only allowed out one hour a day. And they say so they're in the dark zone. And they isolate it. So they're not simply segregate because you can segregate people without isolating them. You can take all of us, the half of us who have TB, you put us one side, the other half you leave that way. So we can be segregated into a group. They don't do that. They isolate as well. So people are put into solitary confinement. And the result of that case is that that set the ground, the court, the what is now the Supreme Court of Appeal, which was the appellate division many years back, set the ground rules for how detainees must be treated. The first question is the question of bail. And the, the, the case is important for a whole, whole lot of reasons. The case is important because it speaks about bail. The case is important because it speaks about the rights of awaiting trial prisoners. The case is important because it speaks about access to lawyers. And the case is important because it speaks, it speaks to the fact of how anyone who loses their liberty should be treated. So the first, the first question was about bail. The Chief Justice Van de Villiers said the following. He said, it can't be that a poor person who cannot afford bail is put into a prison and then punished as a consequence. That the only reason someone goes on remand or awaiting trial is to make sure that they appear in court. That's the only reason. And that awaiting trial prisoners have a very specific set of rights. More rights than someone who's been sentenced. So you can wear your own clothes, you can have access to more books, you can have access to more visitors, you can a whole bunch of things which you can't get elsewhere. And essentially what the court said is that you cannot take more rights away from someone simply because they've been put in prison. Whether they're sentenced or unsentenced, they have rights. So you can't beat up someone, as James was explaining, you can't beat up someone in prison just because he's in prison. The imprisonment itself is the punishment. The taking away of freedom is punishment. For waiting trials, it shouldn't be a punishment, but because people can't afford bail, or because they're a threat to society, or because there's some other reasons that they're not being denied bail, is a problem. So, why is this important to us? I think all of us here will know someone who spent time in prison. If we don't, then there's a problem. Because in our society, <laughs> then we need to take you out to meet some, 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 some people. Um, because in our society, so many, the, the people who are being punished, as is shown from what Claire says and what Jane is saying and what Sean is saying, are working class people, the majority of people. Daddy Lee was a white working class elderly person. He was 53, he was in my age bracket. He came out four and a half years later when he was nearly 60. With TB, he'd been in a cell, and sometimes in a cell uh, for one per that was meant for one person, three people to a cell, sometimes in a cell with over 60 people, and so on. So that's one set of uh, uh, reasons. I want to give you two, three other simple examples of work that we've done that led to the Kailitsha Commission of Inquiry and why this is important to our work. Everyone here will know about the case of Roland Lafana, the uh, HIV positive activist leader of the Treatment Action Campaign who was raped and murdered because she had HIV. What we often forget, what we often forget is that the perpetrators of the crime spent more than two years awaiting time. Now, that delay in access to justice because the Constitution guarantees that everyone should be brought before a court and their case should be settled within a reasonable time, which is what Claire is talking about, the review mechanism at the end. The problem is here, twofold. The victim and their family suffers 
because they have to constantly go back to court and so on and so forth. On the other hand, the perpetrator also has a family. The perpetrator also has a family. The family will not necessarily support what the perpetrator has done, but he, mostly it's him, because we men are the violent ones, um, because he would have done something terrible, but they're still the son you love, or the husband, or the father, whatever it is. So the question is, it's upsetting to that family too. And this has serious consequence. If you remember the case of Nandipa Makeke, which took three, day, three years to finish up, and more than, more than 40 postponements. In that case, you had four minors, four minors spending time in prison and becoming adults while the, while the case was going on. Three years they spent in jail. Most of them were acquitted. Most of them were acquitted. But what happened subsequently is that caused so much tension between the activists who were campaigning for justice, welcome all remember, and, 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 the, and the families and the gangs in their community, that every postponement meant that people had to go underground because they were, they were hunted by gangs. So it's not simply that it has an effect on the perpetrators on, and their families, on the victims and their families, but it can have an impact on people campaigning for justice. So those are things that, that, we, that, that we need to bear in mind. The case that we're most familiar with is that of Zuli Swan Kunyana. Again, you had two minors who had spent three and a half years in jail when their defense lawyer suddenly decided he had to bring up the case that they had given their confessions without a parent or a lawyer present. And of course, six months later, the magistrate said, yes, this, this is what happened, and they get it out. They were between 16 and 17 when they went into jail. They were by that time in their 20s. So their most important years as young men taken away from them. They may have been guilty, but they may not have been guilty. So from the perspective of someone who wants justice, not all of us here would want to see someone who is charged with the murder being the person who is convicted in the end. Someone who is charged with rape, that he spends more time, and that he <coughs> is a danger to other women, can, his bail can be denied to him. So in that sense, we, not part of the group of people who would say, you need to keep everyone, deny everyone male, and so on. We need to understand that this can happen to anyone. And that brings me to the last question. And this is perhaps something that I, I, I also would like to, for us to have a conversation about. Is everyone here aware of Angie Peter? Um, she's a comrade of ours. She has been a campaigner for safety and security for since 2008 at least. She has probably seen more cases of rape and murder and robbery and police brutality than any one of us. Uh, she always happens to be at the case when the police are beating someone up or shooting at someone and so on. It's very likely that Angie was framed. So what happens, Angie gets charged and her partner gets charged with necklacing someone. There's no evidence other than the police say that the dead man told, mentioned her name to them when they, when he was dying. That's, that's the only evidence they have. Now, what happens? She gets arrested. She spent six weeks in jail before a bail hearing. She is pregnant, she has HIV, she has asthma, she has depression. Now, this is, her husband is the same, he was also in jail. Their children, three children, two, four, four, five children, four, five. Oh, four, four children are left outside uh, with no one, to care, no one that they know to care for them. So, what happens next, they finally get bail, but the only reason they get bail 
is because we had put pressure and we we pay or we raise money. People donated money to pay fifteen thousand rand a day for a bail hearing. That's what the reduced rate of a bail attorney charges. If you went the legal aid route, they're busy, they're overworked. You may get a good person, you may not get a good person, but they're so overworked. Finally, they get out. What happens next is a series of raids by the police on our house. And they want to charge her again a couple of days ago with kidnapping and attempting to lecture someone again. Is they alleged that on Thursday the 4th of April, she and a group of people took an alleged perpetrator of some crime, undescribed crime, to Monwabisi Beach, and they were putting the necklace around him, the tire, and they were about to shoot it off, and uh, they discovered they didn't have matches. So the chap managed to run away. That's the only evidence they have. Meantime, Angie has an hour by hour alibi, including being with people at the time that this was meant to have happened. Imagine she would, she would have lost her bail, she would have gone back to jail, she would have been kept there for when the trial eventually is going to happen. So what I'm, all I'm doing by making these things very concrete to, to all of us is people who are in jail are not angels. Some of them are evil, horrible human beings. They're evil, horrible human beings. Some of them are there because they, they're, they, they're human beings who've made terrible mistakes. Some of them are there because they shouldn't be there. They've committed economic crimes. They've shoplifted. We know, and this is important from on the question of what happens in police cells with waiting bail, the Kailicha inquiries already revealed that in Kailicha, most detainees spend more than 48 hours in detention and then are released without being charged. They don't give us the exact time that people spend. Is it three days? Is it a week? Is it two weeks that people are kept in detention? They don't give us that data. So the reason I'm speaking from this perspective is that people in prison are not angels. They are regarded as among the worst people <coughs> in, in, in society. They are regarded, and I'm not saying they are, I'm saying they're regarded. And it is our job to understand that those are the people who need the most protection. Because it's the easiest group of people to beat up on. Whether it's women in prison, children in prison, men in prison, those people who are in prison, they have their punishment, prison is their punishment. For pre-trial detainees, we should start calling it what it is. It's not pre-trial detainees. It's become detention without trial. And it's become, in the conditions of our prisons, detention without trial with cruel and degrading treatment. Cruel, cruel, degrading treatment and very often torture. Not very often. I may not exaggerate. On occasion, torture, even. If, 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 uh, depending on the type of water you have asked me, I've seen some terrible waters. So, I would like to say that there's a very good case to take, a series of cases to take, um, and perhaps we should start a conversation about how to engage the police committee and the justice committee and correctional services committee uh, on the pre-trial detention uh, guidelines, which Sean will probably take us through now. Thanks. Um, but we would like to give you sufficient opportunity to be able to voice your inputs on the guidelines and on the uh, inputs that you've heard from our three speakers. I, I presume this document is in everyone's pack or you've seen copies of that. And so we would very much like to hear from you this evening what your thoughts are in terms of a general comment on the guidelines and all of us knowing that there are many instruments out there, many policy statements and many codes of conduct. If we are to take this forward, what can we do to assist in its implementation here in South Africa? So we'd very much like to hear on those two matters. But also to say that there is a place for very detailed comments on the guidelines. And there are two avenues. One is the campaign 
is looking to make a submission on these guidelines and to uh, table that with the African Commission. Also, we have on the um, African Pretrial Justice Monitor website, that's apjm.org, uh, PPJA. Web, uh, PPJA, Pretrial Justice Monitor in Africa. PPJA, Pretrial Justice in Africa, PPJA.org website. Uh, the guidelines are tabled and we've created a forum for you to be able to then upload comments that would then be uh, tabulated and then forwarded through to the Commission for their consideration. And we really encourage you to use both of those avenues. But the guidelines that you see in front of you really comes from the um, provisions made within the African Charter on Human and People's Rights for the Commission to formulate any principles or rules uh, relating to human and people's rights upon which uh, member states can then base their legislation or can give further expression to the principles of the Charter and be able to take that forward. So within that mandate, the Commission is now considering these uh, guidelines on pre-trial detention. And the intention behind this is threefold. One, is that they want to start articulating what is an acceptable practice when it comes to the pre-child justice environment. Secondly, they want to use this to encourage domestic law reform where this is necessary. And thirdly, they want to start um, focusing more specifically, both in terms of state reporting and country visits, on the pre-trial environment. So that these guidelines then start setting a checklist set of standards against which they would then be able to analyze state reports when they report to the Commission. And so Africa's report is, is coming up. Um, hopefully they will table their report in November. It might go through in May, but they're due to report. And secondly, um, one of the outcomes of the Commission meeting that happened now in April was an offer by the South African delegation to the Special Rapporteur on Conditions of Detention to visit South Africa. So there should be some progress on having the Special Rapporteur coming in and visiting conditions of detention. And again, these guidelines then form a really important checklist against which you look at the remand facilities. Now the guidelines that you have in front of you, and this is, uh, I'll, I'll just very briefly, um, follow the, the pre-trial phase from arrest through to police detention. And it focuses specifically on that policing environment because this is where a lot of the things fall through the cracks. So from the moment liberty is detained and we realize that this has a significant impact on, um, on uh, a person's uh, rights and um, the right to liberty. But from that point of arrest through to detention in police custody or, or remand facility. So you'll see the first chapters speak to arrest and decisions around arrest, and they set the guidelines around the necessary safeguards to ensure that the decisions to arrest and the process of arrest are um, grounded in, in, a, in a rights environment. So there must be a, a clear basis within law for the arrest. It must not be motivated by discrimination of any kind. The police must identify themselves. They must ensure that the record of the arrest is kept, uh, including the identity of the person. And they must also record whether the person's procedural rights have been communicated to them and observed. And these rights include the right to be informed of the charge, the right to remain silent, the right to have a lawyer, the right to seek bail. And these protections then apply equally the citizens of the country as well as non-citizens, stateless persons, children, as, as the case may be. The second section deals with the issue of arbitrary arrest. Arbitrary arrest refers to that notion of an arrest or the decision to take in, or take in to detain a person um, in police custody contrary to the law or a discriminatory application of that law. And so in order to, to protect against issues around arbitrary arrest, we set out a number of procedural safeguards in this, in this instance. And that the, the decision uh, to detain somebody is only permitted on the grounds that are clearly established in law, that detention is the exception rather than the rule and must be for the shortest period possible, um, that detainees are brought to court promptly, um, and that we're entitled, they're, uh, provide, they're permitted to seek bail, and that 
only uh, detention only be ordered in exceptional circumstances, uh, and if there are legitimate concerns around the suspect that he will either flee or interfere with the uh, process or be a, a threat to the community. And there's a section that deals on safety during pretrial detention. Um, and there are a number of safeguards that are articulated, emphasized within these guidelines. So again, the detainees only be held in official places of detention. They have regular access to counsel uh, and other appropriate persons like family or health practitioners. That the detention is regularly reviewed. That thorough records are kept of the detainee's detention and that there are effective complaint mechanisms in place. There are a number of, uh, or the section to follow then sets out um, uh, procedural or uh, safeguards for minimum conditions of detention, um, and that includes uh, the safeguards necessary to protect somebody from torture and ill treatment, um, and, and include both a substantive and a procedural obligations on behalf of this or by the state. Uh, there is a section on um, the application of the guidelines. It speaks to ratification, but really in, in the, the way in which these are being approached is that it would be adopted by the Commission as a note to then guide its engagement with the state rather than a process of ratification for, for all the states following. So there's been some shift as, as far as that final implementation chapter is concerned. So that's, that's it in a nutshell, and um, really for the, for the minutes left to us, we'd really like to hear from you. Any comments, any thoughts, and also I suppose maybe on the campaign's point, any way in which this discussion, which is happening at a continental level, can assist in the discussions of, of the campaign and the processes of the campaign to, to promote safer communities and a more rights-based approach by policing and criminal justice authorities. So we'll take some questions for the yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lucy Sokia, so I work with uh, Gender Dynamics, who's based in uh, Adelaide. But I wanted to chat with the panelists, so I haven't had a chance to engage with the guidelines themselves. But I wanted to chat with you if you have been encountered or you have been observed, maybe in your research, how gay, lesbian, and transgender people are treated within, um, within the, the, the criminal justice um, or within the arrest and detention. Because we know, for instance, that um, recently or over the years, gay, lesbian, and transgender people have been suffering a lot of hate crimes because of the, how our society is. But then it doesn't end, the suffering doesn't end just outside, even inside, they suffer a lot in the hands of the police and the justice system. And so in the um, recent months, we've been working with the, um, the Western Cape, uh, the SAPS, to improve their standard operating procedures when they deal with this particular cost. And therefore, we would like um, an opportunity to input on these guidelines that we are developing to recognize that process one of the groups that is suffering in the Thank you. So we'll certainly take note of, of, of that comment on the guidelines. And I think what we'll do is take the input from the floor and then allow for the panel maybe in terms of kind of closing off and concluding remarks to be able to respond more directly to, to those inputs. Thank you very much. Any other? I'm Sean. I work in the Funo Kwasi. My question is probably aimed at James and Claire, and it's on the unfilled positions. Is that because of uh, a lack of money, a uh, skill shortage, or is it an administration problem where people just aren't really being hired, or was it some other problem? I, so we'll, we'll take that oh. and then answer towards it, so if you can kind of remember that, um, and then the other issue in the great space to, to be able to respond to those points. My question is for Claire and Zappi. I just want to ask you questions. I want to know what the reasons of the reasons, what kind of reasons are given by either the prosecution or police for not bringing uh, arrested persons uh, to bail 
engineering within the 48 hour rule. And my second question is for everybody. I just want to know what are responses by the Department of Justice and Department of Correctional Services sort of when engaging with them or inviting them to uh, discussions like this. I'm um, Joel from SJC. Um, James spoke about the sort of culture in prisons of um, staff operating, um, you know, sense with a sense of vengeance, a sense of you know, throwing away the key. Um, and I wanted to know what role civil society can play in terms of promoting a more professional criminal justice system as a whole. Because I mean, these are all excellent on paper, but we know already the police and the courts fail to do so many simple things. How are we going to exert further pressure with this extra things that need to be added? So I, I, I'll give you two tips. I, actually, the, the question that Joel tonight puts is a, something that I think we should all engage with. How, how do we actually take this forward and, and use both the, <coughs> the, the issues that have been raised, the challenges that we have, the opportunity of these guidelines to be able to encourage a demand of more professional service and something that that is isn't trying to be more important in human rights. Did you at the back of the... No, just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Jeanine. I'm going to come over. Um, my question regarding the safeguards for living conditions of detention. And one of the issues that keep being brought up is the overcrowding and the conditions that the prisoners and the waiting trial um, are facing. And I want to know why the guidelines don't really make um, emphasis or even just point to structural conditions because this should be adhered to. I understand there is minimum guidelines that are separate to it, but isn't that something that should be maybe emphasized again here? Um, I've got lots of questions, but I won't. I'll touch on two. Um, I'm Lisa from Restore, um, and we've been doing voluntary work in Paul's more for about eight years now. So I also have lots of stories I could tell, but won't. Um, but just touching on um, one issue, I, I, in my master's I, I touched on a book called Criminal Injustice, and it covered, it, it covered pre-trial, it covered police, it covered many areas. So when I looked at that book, and it's available PDF online, um, it really just helped me understand the bigger picture um, of the criminal justice system and how it functions. Um, and, you know, because working in Plausible, working purely with GCS and um, with um, those that are awaiting trial and sentenced, um, you know, that was sort of one piece of the pie, but there's actually many pieces of the pie. So, so something that stood out was that, um, that, that there's actually, like, with statistics, um, uh, there's sort of police are encouraged to make more uh, arrests and courts are encouraged to increase convictions, and yet, um, you know, and then we're saying, well, but there's all this overcrowding and, and, you know, da, 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 da. But so, so it's almost like, you know, one, one area is, is increasing where, you know, there's pressure on another side. So there's different pressures going on within the system. So, I mean, that's something to, to really, obviously, understand in the bigger picture. I don't know if that's a question or just highlighting something. And then second of all, um, my focus has been on restorative justice. And... Um, obviously, looking at pre-trial, um, it, it may not be um, as as big a focus, but the South Africa's national policy framework has adopted the scores of justice at any stage um, as intervention. So has, I kind of did a quick search in the document on any word of restorative, and it didn't come up. So I just was wondering if at any stage, I mean, it may not be specifically for that document necessary, but surely if we're looking at safe communities and we're looking at restorative justice looks at the victim, the offender, the families, all those things you've spoken about, it does look at that and it is being adopted into policy. So again, yes, great on policy, how does one implement it? That's a great question, but you know, that, that was sort of my, my interest for being part of the discussion. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Any other thoughts on this document and this process and, and this area of our legal resources? Well, we haven't been really moving from the um, policy 
I'm very interested in the guidelines and how it intersects with the um, prevention and combating of torture of persons for And one of the areas that we've been focusing on is the right of the victim to compensation being received. And we've been engaging with either with SAPs around victims of torture. And what we've come to the realization is that it's very difficult for either SAPs to engage with the victim of torture within the context of perpetrator. And there is no line of alleged perpetrator and perpetrator for um, those officials. Simply perpetrator, um, whether you've had a time or not. And so um, I'm very interested in the issues around the right to to help your right, your right to mental health when you become a victim of torture. We are finding Victims who come forward to say we've been tortured in the police cell. We don't keep them longer than two sessions. They disappear. And I think it has to do with the harassment and the intimidation and having to go back into a community who is not open to accepting them in the context of their victimhood. So we're debating these issues and the blurring of victim to perpetrator and how it actually impacts on uh, the torture victim, uh, especially when there's been the horrendous crime. Uh, there's no sympathy in the community uh, when you become a torture victim. And yet, torture affects the entire community. Uh, so I think this is an area that requires far more debate. And for us, the greatest challenge is getting SAPs, getting Eifert to acknowledge the contestations and the difficulties that they are having with this issue of victims. So we've asked them the question in the victim empowerment forums, for example. Now, social development as national policy guidelines <coughs> around victim. They go so far as to identify torture victims as victims who require services. But the minute you locate torture victims within the context of an alleged perpetrator of crime, it is very difficult for them to transcend and see that alleged perpetrator in a different light. And we've seen how that is um, impacting on providing uh, torture victims with mental health services. Um, and this is a big challenge for us as an organization because while we can provide them with a service, they are not open to going deeper um, in terms of their counseling or in terms of other programs that they have. Um, they tend to go underground, and that's a major fear um, that we are in a battleground for us. Sure, so just a quick comment. Um, I know actually there's a physical stimulus. A lot of it is about the physical abuse, but we can't obviously not get the psychological effects. So the, I'm sure they often, I'm sure the two go hand in hand, yeah. um, but I think mean, it needs to be a focus on, on that as well, and after care treatment. Are there any other comments before I hand it back to the panel? Okay, so there have been some <coughs> questions, specific questions to the to the panelists. So there'll be an opportunity to answer those. And then maybe in your concluding remarks, just reflect on potentially how the campaign could use the opportunity of this discussion on the pre-trial environment through the, the vehicle of those guidelines to forward some of the objectives of the campaign. Okay, let me kick start. Um, the, the other question, uh, particularly directed to that, I think there's quite well, but I think uh, the, the first question is regarding the, the unfilled positions within um, the centers. It's not for the absence of money. 
as of I think last year, the Department of Correctional Services actually uh, sent money back to the Treasury and spent, even when it was budgeted. They just sent it back because they couldn't just spend it. So it's not about the absence of money. And well, of course, we are glad that we have been people pointing out that these essential services are required indeed if we are to be not paying deep service to women rights interest of women. And indeed, uh, more and more, we see the department uh, beginning to really advertise these positions. And it is our hope indeed that they will be filled, and not just one or two. Because, of course, as you check the ratio, one is to 3,000 units. I mean, it's just still nothing. It's just a, 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 a tip of an iceberg. Now, the, the, the reality is that it's not about the absence of money. That's it. Now, regarding the, the other remark uh, of uh, the, 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 the police being expected to do more arrests, the prosecution being expected to do more convictions, the magistrates as well judges expected to hand over stiffer sentences. My view is that uh, the, the problem actually starts at arrest. There are so many people that are arrested unnecessarily. <coughs> Um, um, because you would find police sometimes are very vengeful. They would, they would, they would normally, if they, if they are to avoid having to present you before a court of law, before the lapse of 48 hours, they would, they would come on and find you. Even when they are all along being known, of course, the case has been opened against you. They would rather wait until it's Friday so that they enjoy and they feel satisfied with having you in custody while they weekend, which is. Well, stupid, so to speak, my view that is. But then the problem, I think, is because um, I really don't think majority of them are actually properly uh, trained in terms of the CPA, I mean the Criminal Procedure Act. The Criminal Procedure Act makes a number of uh, means and ways in terms whereby you can secure the attendance of that person before court, give a written notice, give a warning, tell this person to come to court. But they prefer just one mode, the indignity of arrest. They just love. The, 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 this thing of them having, you know, to effect arrest and all that. And in majority of cases, they don't even give the accused persons, uh, the, 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 I mean, uh, explain to them their right to an uh, attorney, a right to all those many rights. In, in, in many cases, they don't even know what are the rights that they need to advise the of. Now, um, I think uh, those are the two issues that I have noted. I forgot the, the actually I didn't hear it properly the, the other question from the other gentleman. I think let me just say something about that. Um, just the, linking to the question about the, the filling of posts, um, alongside that, which I think is another problem um, in relation to poor management. Is, is the, the, some increasing reliance on use of consultants. So there's no there's no sort of build up of um, various important skills within the um, department itself, um, be it the use of various security equipment or um, kitchen management, um, training courses on sort of sexual victimization and bullying, mm -hmm. you name it, it's all sort of found out um, that it's, you know, it's all across them, you know, I, I don't know, there was a widely publicized auditor general reports on the sort of um, sort of misuse and wasteful expenditure that has been sort of poured out uh, on your services when in fact there should be um, sort of a market, market attempt to obtain at least some sort of special um, um, sort of uh, expertise within the department itself. So it's, it's a huge problem um, that the department is facing. Um, in relation to social workers and psychologists, um, it, it's quite obvious that there aren't enough and that they're sort of desperately needed. Um, certainly money isn't a problem, but it's an incredibly um, challenging working environment, which the department has very little to alleviate. Um, so the, the social work, workers' monthly budget, for example, is, is minuscule, it's a couple of hundred grand a, a month. If, if you're going to try and do, engage in any kind of meaningful rehabilitation program, you need a lot more money uh, and a lot more resources and support than the department seems to be willing to, to donate, and, and that really speaks to the, the kind of culture within the department.
happened, which is, really isn't human rights or rehabilitative <coughs> um, orientated or, or, or focused. So that's an, there isn't a lack of social workers graduating every year. The problem is, is that the work environment is simply awful. Um, the bail issue. Um, Police services in, in general are court. To make any kind of bail determination, you need a certain amount of information for a magistrate or a judge. You need to know what the fixed address is, you need to know um, previous convictions, you need to know um, next of kin, and, and so on and so on. Um, and there also needs to be a certain amount of evidence backing the charge which the police and prosecutor wish to proceed with. The bail even though the accused goes to court, the bail decision is made because that information is which means the bail decisions themselves are repeatedly delayed over weeks and weeks and weeks. So it's not that they're not taken to court, it's that the fact that the information isn't provided by the police um, to, for the magistrate to be able to make um, an informed decision. And it, it leads to a certain amount of frustration, this is simply why, no, and, um, you know, another reason why uh, you know, we, we have an sort of overcrowding problem. That also speaks to the problem of the, the, our uh, detective services in the country. We have a very poor detective service. Um, detective, you know, being a detective is very different from being a police officer. Um, for various reasons, um, greater resources and, and, and money was poured into sort of visible policing, um, so to speak, uh, which didn't make sense if you're in a township and there's no street lighting. But for, for whatever reason, that model was employed um, at the expense of capacitating um, the detective service. Um, as a result, it, it's very, very, very poorly staffed and the expertise is largely gone. Um, this means that we don't get convictions. Um, so justice just doesn't happen. Um, it also means that there's a great chance that a um, police, police official is going to try and beat a confession out of somebody because the, the, the expertise needed to proceed with the trial and, um, and, and the leading of the evidence it, it is simply not there. Um, issues of sexuality in, in prison, um, it's an enormous problem. Um, I think it, it's particularly depressing. The, uh, what I find particularly depressing right now is that there has been a sexual offences draft policy sitting on the commissioner's desk for at least two to three years. It's a beautiful document. It just hasn't <laughs> gained the momentum um, on the part of the department to be passed. Um, this is this is not, um, you know, for once it having been uh, raised by various civil society actors in Parliament. We, you know, there are a number of, just Detention International, for example, there are a number of organizations who are working to protect the rights of the sexually vulnerable in prisons that have raised this problem time and time again, every quarter before Parliament. And this draft policy, um, unfortunately, is, is, is just sitting there and not being put to use. There is a clause in the legislation which says that the, the needs or interests of, I think the term is sexually vulnerable, must be taken into account. And there's, in, in my experience, there have been instances where um, uh, a sort of an openly gay young man will be separated um, from the general male population. Um, yeah, but that tends to depend on the attitude of the warder. You know, it's not something that is implemented um, generally. It, it's not a it's not a normal practice you will see. Um, another example is uh, children are supposed to be separated from adults. Um, in prison, and, and what you will find that you will have a special needs section in a, in a male section where the children and the homosexual males are, are put because they all turned as special, which is a demonstrative <laughs> lack of understanding of what it means <laughs> to be gay or lesbian or transgender. Um, you know, you consider to have the same needs as a child, or because you're smaller, or because you might be more effeminate. We know that these for the most part, men or boys in prison are far more vulnerable than the larger ones, and they're at great, much greater risk of being raped or sexually abused or just bullied. Um, and uh, it seems bizarre to me, um, and, and indeed really, really curious that there is this policy to deal with this kind of stuff, but it, 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 it has remained largely sort of dormant. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I, 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 I there are a bunch of things, but I think I think this is the beginning of a discussion. It shouldn't be taken as an end to the discussion. And I think it's vital that we all work together on a few basic things to try and push them right. For instance, these guidelines on sexual orientation or sexually vulnerable group, that's something that we can push for. 
But just to take what's come out of the Kailicha Commission, and the reason I keep on hammering on this, or talking about it, is I think it's a useful starting point. Because the same things need to happen in Mannenberg, and in Mitchell's Plain, and in Blue Downs, and in the other parts of the country. So, one of the things that emerged uh, here is that what people are arrested for, Claire made the point that the majority of people are arrested for minor offenses. More than 50% of convictions secured by the Kailicha police are for pocket knives. For pocket knives. That's what the court, that's what the investiga investigation shows. I'm sure that's true for in many parts of, 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 of the country. So already we don't need to wait for the Commission of Inquiry to, to be heard. We can write to the Commission and say, your report has shown this. What is your guarantee? Can you give us statistics of how many people have been arrested for pocket knives in the last three months? And what's been done to stop it? And you know, so, so we can, that's something simple, and that, that would, could reduce, have a preventative effect on pre-trial detention stuff. The other thing is, people have been told that they're arrested for longer than 48 hours. We should approach the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee and say, we want you to do an inspection, a quick inspection, and find out in all the cells in Kailicha and take Manenberg while you're at it, and find out who's been there longer than 48 hours and why. Uh, we don't need to wait for the Commission of Inquiry to establish and, and make those things, uh, to start fixing up uh, those, those things already. Um, the other thing that I think would be uh, uh, an, an imp important question is to discuss, uh, uh, for, the, for our group to discuss, bail determination and bringing people to court for bail hearings and getting those bail hearings done within seven days, which is what, the, I think that's what the law is, that within seven days you should have had a bail hearing. And you, you have a right to have a bail hearing as quickly as possible, but no longer than seven days. So we need to find some way of enforcing that um, so that we at least get those things. So those are a few small things. But again, I think, uh, a good thing for us to do would be to study the guidelines, to comment on them, whether it's on the question of restorative justice or whether it's on the, on, on, on the questions of torture, which are very serious. Okay, so thank you very much. It's 7.30. I'm going to end off for 7.40 now. We're going to end off here. There is some refreshment served. Um, I'd like to... First of all, thank the panelists and Claire, James, for making the time for all those inputs. I'd like to thank Dan for all the work in terms of organising.